Welcome to Mobile and Trauma Radiography Class 1 by Brandy Jones. Intro to Mobile and Trauma Radiography. It's divided into two sections. Mobile and Trauma Radiography will be Class 1 and 2. Surgical Radiography will be Class 3. Today we're going to learn about Trauma and Mobile Radiography. Mobile and Trauma Radiography. Students are often intimidated by mobile trauma and OR procedures due to the nature of the patient's condition, different equipment, unfamiliar surroundings, and working with personnel outside of radiology. It is important to gain knowledge and experience in these areas. Experience is truly the greatest asset. Being prepared to face challenges presented by these procedures, maintain an open mind, critical thinking, and accept that learning is a product of effort and experience will allow for development of the skill necessary to become proficient in trauma and mobile radiography, as well as surgical radiography. Skeletal trauma and fracture terminology require an understanding of terms that are unique to situations that radiographers will encounter. One, dislocation, two, subluxation, three, sprain, four, contusion, and five, fracture. Dislocation refers to the displacement of a bone that is no longer in contact with its normal articulation. It must be imaged in two planes 90 degrees to each other to demonstrate the degree of displacement. In trauma, one of the most common dislo dislocations are the shoulder. Subluxation, partial dislocation. A partial dislocation is illustrated. See the arrow, the vertebrae is displaced posteriorly. Another example is the nurse maid's elbow. A partial dislocation of the radial head in a child caused by a hard pull on the arm. A sprain and contusion. Sprain is a forced wrenching or twisting of a joint that results in a partial rupture or tearing of supporting ligaments without dislocation. May result in severe damage to associated blood vessels, tendons, ligaments, or, and or nerves. Swelling and bruising may be present. Handle with care while performing radiograph symptoms appear to be the same as fractures. Contusion, a bruised type of injury with a possible avulsion fracture. Fracture is a break in the bone. The radiographer must use caution in moving and positioning the patient. You do not want to cause further injury or displacement. Never force the body part into a position. Fracture alignment terminology. Alignment refers to the associative relationship between the long axis of the fracture fragments. Apposition describes the manner in which the fragmented ends of the bone make contact with each other. Three terms to describe. Angulation, the loss of alignment of the fracture. Apex is the direction of the angulation and is opposite in relation to the distal part of the fracture fragments. Three terms can be used to describe this type of direction. Apposition. The first term is anatomic apposition. Anatomic alignment of the ends of fractured fragments. The ends of the fragments make end-to-end -end contact. Number two is the lack of apposition. Ends of fragments are aligned but pulled apart and are not making contact with each other. For example, if excessive traction is used. A bayonet apposition is a fracture fragment overlap and the shafts make contact, but not at the fracture ends. Angulation, apex angulation, the direction or the angle of the apex of the fracture, such as medial or lateral apex. The point or apex of the fracture points medially or laterally. Number two, varus deformity. The distal fragment ends are angled towards the midline of the body and the apex is pointed away from the midline. Number three, a valgus deformity. The distal fragment ends are angled away from the midline and the apex is pointed towards the midline. Note, varus and valgus are also used in inversion evers in stress terms. Types of fractures. Simple closed fracture is a fracture of the bone that does not break through the skin. A compound, an open fracture, in which the portion of the bone, usually fragmented, protrudes through the skin. Incomplete or partial fracture. A fracture that does not traverse through the entire bone. A torus fracture. A buckle of the cortex 
The cortex is the outer portion of the bone, not a complete break, also known as a buccal fracture. Green stick fracture. A fracture is on one side only. The cortex on one side is broken and the other is bent. When straightened, a faint fracture line is present on one side and a slight bulging wrinkle like defect is on the other. Also known as hickory or willow stick fracture. Most common in children. Complete fracture. The break is complete and includes the cross section of bone broken into two pieces. Types of complete fractures. One, transverse fracture. The fracture is transverse at near right angle to the long axis of the bone. Two, an oblique fracture. Fracture passes through the bone at an oblique angle. Three, spiral fracture. In this fracture, the bone has been twisted apart at the fracture spirals around the long axis. A comminuted fracture. In this fracture, the bone is splintered or crushed at the site at the impact, resulting in two or more fragments. Three types of comminuted fractures. A segmental, a type of double fracture in which two fracture lines isolate a distant segment of bone. The bone is broken into three pieces with a middle fragment fractured at both ends. A butterfly fracture, a comminuted fracture with two fragments on each side of the main wedge shaped separate fragment has some resemblance to the wings of a butterfly. A splintered fracture, a comminuted fracture in which the bone is splintered into thin sharp fragments. Impacted fracture. One fragment is firmly driven into the other, such as the shaft of the bone being driven into the head or the end segment. These most common occur at distal or proximal ends of the femur, humerus, or radius. Specific named fractures, usually named by the fracture or by the person who identifies it. Barton's fracture. This is an intraarticular fracture of the posterior lip of the distal radius. A baseball or mallet fracture. This fracture of the distal phalanx is caused by a ball striking the end of the fingertips. A Bennett's fracture, longitudinal fracture, which occurs at the base of the first metacarpal. Boxer's fracture. This fracture most commonly involves the distal fifth metacarpal, angulation best demonstrated on the lateral view. It results from punching someone or something. Achilles fracture. This fracture of the wrists in which the distal radius is fractured with the distal fragment displaced posteriorly may result from a fall on an outstretched arm. A Smith's fracture, which is known as a reverse Collie's fracture, is a fracture of the wrist with the distal fragment of the radius displaced anteriorly rather than posterior as in the collies. Commonly results in a backward fall on an outstretched arm. Hangman's fracture. This fracture occurs through pedicles of the axis of C2 with or without displacement of C2 or C3. A Hutchinson's fracture. This is an intraarticular fracture of the radius stylo process. The name comes from the time when the hand cranked cars would backfire, with the crank striking the lateral side of the distal forearm. A Montiegas fracture. This fracture is a proximal half of the ulna, along with the dislocation of the radial head, may result from defending blows with a raised forearm. Potts fracture. This term is used to describe a complete fracture of the distal fibula with major injury to the ankle joint, including a ligament damage and frequent fracture of the distal tibia or malleolus. Additional fractures, avulsion fracture. This fracture results from severe stress to a tendon or a ligament in a joint. A fragment of a bone is separated or pulled away by the attached tendon or ligament. A chip fracture. This fracture involves an isolated bone fragment. This is not the same as an evolution fracture because this fracture is not caused by tendon or ligament stress. Blowout and or tripod fracture. These fractures which result from a direct blow to the orbit and or maxilla and zygoma create fractures to the orbital floor and lateral orbital margins. A compression fracture. 
This vertebral fracture is caused by compression type injury. The vertebral body collapses or is compressed. A depression fracture. In this fracture of the skull, a fragment is depressed. Appearance is similar to a ping pong ball that has been pressed in by a finger. But if the indentation can be elevated again, it can assume its near original position. The fifth seal fracture. This is a fracture through the fifth seal plate, the point of union of the epiphysis. They can be classified as a Salter Harris 1 through 5. Pathologic fracture. These fractures are due to disease process within the bone. A stellate fracture. In this fracture, the fracture lines radiate from the, the central point of injury with a star-like pattern. The most common example of this type of fracture occurs at the patella, and it is often caused by the knee hitting a dashboard in MVC. A stress fracture. A non-trauma type fracture, it is caused by repeated stress on the bone. Trimalalar fracture. This fracture of the ankle joint involves the medial, lateral, and posterior malali of the distal tibia. Tuft or burst fracture. This comminuted fracture of the distal phalanx may be caused by a crushing blow to the distal finger or thumb. Portable radiography. The first portable unit. Three basic types of mobile units. Portable refers to a small handheld first designed by Picker for World War I. It had a 15 MA generator. It's for chest and extremities in the field. Mobile. A full-powered institutional unit, much heavier and a motor or muscle driven, and a fluoroscopic, a C-arm and or mini C-arm or fluoroscan. Basic types of mobile radiography, a battery powered unit, a capacitor discharge unit, a high frequency unit, and mobile fluoroscopic or C-arm units. Battery powered units, they were higher an average photon energy, self-propelled at the average walking speed at two and a half to three miles an hour. They provide a constant KVP and MAS. They have parking brakes that are automatic, also known as dead man. So you let go of the brake and it's an instant stop. Um, rechargeable batteries, DC high frequency pulsed power, and generator that had a three phase output. Power drive, self-propulsion unit, a dead man switch, and you must use caution when piloting. Capacitor discharge units. The voltage drops during exposure. A capacitor discharge system means it stores electrical charges when plugged in. The discharges electrical energy across the x-ray tube when the exposure is initiated, therefore decreasing voltage. Without battery power, it needs a wall outlet. Much lighter and usually not a motor driven, so they were hard to push. High voltage transformer, a generator with constant potential output. These are obsolete. High frequency units, these are very expensive. Not many are in use. Smaller, more compact, minimal voltage ripple, higher efficiency, high voltage transformer. Techniques are usually um, three phase like a standard x-ray room. Portable companies, if you choose to work for a portable company, you may be packing up a machine that is able to travel from place to place, like nursing homes, clinics, and patients' homes. These types of x-ray equipment are able to come apart so you can put them in the back of your vehicle. MAS, milliampere seconds. Low power units are not capable of high MAS techniques for grid radiography. Double or triple exposure, be careful, do not overload the tube. For example, L5S1 spot film in OR, you would need 300 MAS. Grids must be level, the X-ray beam properly centered to the grid, 
correct focal distance, best grids for portable radiography are 8 to 1, with a focal range of 36 inches to 44 inch SID, using a 70 to 90 kVp range. Anode heel effect. The anode should be placed at the thinner end of the body part, for example, top of the spine. The cathode should be placed at the thicker end of the body part. Heel effect increases with short SID, larger field sizes, which is more common in portable radiography. The beam travels through the thicker part of the target of the anode side, thus increasing the attenuating beam. SID. Standard SIDs are usually 40 inches or 72. In some cases, getting 72 inches may be challenging for mobile radiography, and in which 60 inches will suffice. Problems with greater SID are increased technique, which increases your dose. More so, it increases the MAS, and in this, it increases motion. Radiation protection. Mobile radiography produces some of the highest occupational radiation exposure for radiographers. Wear your lead. Distance, step back two meters or six feet at a minimum. Wear your dosimeter above the lead at the collar level to measure your exposure. X-ray, X-ray, X-ray. Make sure you announce before exposing and give time for personnel to move away at a safe distance. The digital age. Digital, mobile, portable radiography. Major advances, the most notable advancements have been made in mobile equipment. Used throughout the hospital, more so now than ever before. Any location or any unit it can go to. ER, ICU, NICU, and OR are the most common. Advantages of digital includes CR and DR. It is well suited for trauma, ED, and OR. The wide exposure latitude of the digital images have improved the consistency and reduced the repeat rate due to positioning and technical variables. The ability to transfer electronically to PACS so physicians can see the images immediately and faster diagnose and create an, and act on a patient's care plan. Most instances, the physicians may view the image on the portable machine with you. Digital units. Portable radiography machines are made up of several components, a wheeled base, a generator, a control panel, and a supported x-ray tube. Portable radiography. This is a care stream portable machine. This is my favorite, especially with students. Anybody know why? Has anyone seen this in any of the sites you go to? It is my favorite because it still has a grid that you must physically apply. It has a touch screen button which you click when you want a grid or a screen or tabletop. Students really seem to get it. Safety. One of the first things to figure out is you may have to learn how and where to park the machine base to be able to swing the arm in the correct way needed to obtain your images. Also, you must park the portable in a machine in a place where you can exit immediately and safely with your equipment in the event the patient goes insane and you need to exit. Do not block yourself in. Always leave yourself an exit. Portable radiography. It is important to learn your equipment and your settings. This is a Samsung digital portable machine. It has a lot of nice features. It uses a SIM grid that is on all the time. A SIM grid is absolutely amazing, especially in the portable world. You do not have to worry about grid lines, and it will clean up scatter within a logarithm, providing you with the best image. You don't have to worry if you are slightly off angle. It's amazing. There is a cover that goes over top of the IR to protect only when the patient weight is above 250 pounds. This is an additional grid also. It will help clean up the scatter. The protocols are set as a low dose pre-selected techniques using higher KVPs and low MAS, which reduce the dose. The digital machine, the Samsung, has some really nice features you newbies will like. In the next couple slides you will see. If you look up at the picture in the right hand corner, 
you will see these are controls on the tube that move the base without having to walk all the way back around and reposition the portable base with the handle bar. Also look at the double laser lines. They will meet once you have the appropriate SID. It is quite amazing. Portable radiography. Check your equipment before you whisk away to do that super stat and look like a fool and have the physician angry with you because you are not prepared. This is Samsung equipment setup and all are very similar. This is the main screen page login. Once you log in, check that your machine is online and ready to go. These icons have green dot on them indicating all is working. Red dot indicates something is wrong or offline. You may need to reset or reboot or turn your IR cassette back on. Portable radiography. You may add any exam at any time. For this machine, everything must be in blue to work. So if you wanted to add shoulder, you have to add shoulder in blue. Then go to procedure and add all shoulder. And then protocol. You're going to add each specific view that you would like, and then it will go on to the right side, and you can add it there. Portable radiography. Okay, does anybody know the difference between these two screens? So A is a screen, a, a technique, tabletop technique, however you want to call it. We know this by using 80 kVp at 1.2 MAS. You can change a few things. You can change your patient size to adjust this, or you can use your up and down buttons to adjust this. Okay. And then we have B, which is a grid technique, and we know this because the receptor shows a little grid on the side and it's pushed. And we also have more selections. So now we have that our smart sim grid is on, and we have large focal spot. You can also tell by the 110 kVp at the 3.2 MAS. This is more of a um, chest radiograph that we would take. Portable radiography is usually performed on a patient when the patient is too sick to leave the room, the patient may not be stable enough to leave the room, coding or about to code. The patient may have too many lines and or tubes deeming them unable to leave the room, for example ICU, but not limited to. The patient may be an elopement risk, a risk to harm themselves or others. A surgeon that requires an x-ray for a lost instrument and or a miscount during When would it not be a good idea for portable radiography? Portal machines do not always have the capacity to obtain good images on patients that are morbid obese. The new digital portal machines are programmed for low-dose techniques and will not allow you to go above a certain KV, MA, and time. With even, even newer programming, we all have more limitations than ever. The machine will not allow you to expose if it does not agree with the settings. A maximum output range is limit mobile radiography, making larger body parts less diagnostic. The doctor thinks it's faster to do it. Portable radiography. Introducing the new carbon nanotubes, providing an even lower doses and techniques. A new x-ray tube design made of carbon nanotubes may be the most significant advance in x-ray technology in 100 years. It could lead to portable and miniature x-ray sources for medical and industrial applications. From article on laser and focus world, here is the web address if you want to read more. We have one at university and it's really neat. Some helpful tips. When performing a portable exam, the patient really needs to remain in bed. Communicate with the RN prior to moving the patient from a chair to the bed or vice versa. Always knock and introduce yourself. Check your name and date of birth. Pay attention at all times to your patient. Never leave the brakes unlocked on a bed. Never leave the side rails down. Before starting the exam, know that the patient's exact position. 
If the bed is angled at 30 degrees, please put it back to 30 degrees. Fix the sheets, tuck your patient in, pull the sheets tight under. For patients with bed sores, even for a short time, can develop or worsen. So keep the sheets tight and help prevent air pockets underneath the patient that may break down the skin, causing and are contributing to a bed sore. Also, push your bedside tables back where the patient can reach them. Hand washing and or hand sanitizing. Always use hand sanitizer before entering a patient's room. After positioning for your patient for the exam, remove your gloves and sanitize before touching your equipment to um, further angle and set your techniques. Always use hand sanitizer after leaving the room or upon exiting. Depending if your patient is on isolation precautions, you may be required to wash your hands as well. A golden rule, always leave your patient better than the way you found them. Like I said before, cover your patient back up, help them into a better position, watch your IVs and other lines, move patient's trays to a reachable position, give patient the call bell, close the curtain for privacy and or door. Always lower the bed to the lowest points of the floor. Reduce falls. For safety, always lower the bed. Always clean the portable after leaving the patient's room and don't forget to What is wrong with this picture? That's right. No gloves. Always wear gloves while cleaning. You must use proper handling while using wipes. What is wrong with this picture? Please take a look. We have a clean tech and a dirty tech. What is happening here? Yes, we have a clean tech touching the dirty IR from the dirty tech. That is a no-no. There we go. Always wear proper PPE while imaging a patient that is on contact isolation. Remember your proper clean tech and dirty tech techniques. What is wrong with this picture? Do you see anything? I see excessive amount of collimation that is open and no lead shield. Here we go. This is more like it. We have a properly collimated field size to the part and a lead shield and we have a good 72 inch SID. What is wrong in this picture? Ron has his thumb down for a unacceptable picture. That's right. He is too close to the portable machine. He has not stretched out his core to six feet. He is also not wearing lead. This is more like it. Practice radiation protection while performing portables. Step back six feet, at least. Wear your lead. Practice time, distance, and shielding. Common indications for portable chest and abdomen radiographs. Pick line placement, central line placement, ET tube placement, NG and OG tube placement, Dubhoff placement, a pneumothorax, chest tube placement, G tube placement, J tube placement, pacemaker insertion, defibrillator, a triple lumen, and a dialysis catheter. Pick line. A pick line, by definition and per its own acronym, peripherally inserted central catheter. It has a long, slender, small, flexible tube that is inserted into a peripheral vein, typically in an upper arm, and advanced until the catheter tip terminates in a large vein in the chest near the heart to obtain intravenous access. A PIC line may be requested for a variety of treatment options, which includes some of the following, a prolonged IV antibiotic treatment, IV access obtained by less invasive and longer lasting methods, 
multiple access obtainable with one or more access line, TPN nutrition, chemotherapy, IV access related to physical factors, and home or subacute discharge for extended treatment. Here is a radiograph of a PIC line. As you can see, it's coming down almost just to, to the SVC there. Central line, an IV line that is inserted into a large vein, the superior vena cava, typically in the neck or near the heart for therapeutic and diagnostic purposes. To administer medicines, fluids, the arrow is pointing to the tip of the central line. Intubation, ET tube placement, endotracheal ET tube, commonly known as ETT. It is a hollow plastic tube that is placed in the trachea through the mouth. The trachea is also known as the windpipe or airway. The ET tube is then attached to a respirator. The tube, and when placed correctly, should be just about as noticed where the arrow is. Chest tube. Chest tubes drain blood, fluid, or air from around your lungs. This allows your lungs to fully expand. The tube is placed between your ribs and into the space between the inner lining and the outer lining of your lungs. This is called the pleural space. The location of the chest tube will depend on the area where the lung has collapsed. Here you can see on the right side where the lung has collapsed and the tube has been inserted all the way up into the apices of the right lung. Pacemaker insertion. A pacemaker is a small device that's placed in the chest or abdomen to help control abnormal heart rhythms. This device uses electrical pulses to prompt the heart to beat. A chest radiograph with a pacemaker. Defibrillator or an ICD. An implantable cardio inverter defibrillator ICD is a small battery powered electrical impulse generator that is implanted in patients who are at risk for sudden cardiac death due to ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. This device is programmed to detect cardiac arrhythmia and correct it by delivering a jolt of electricity. This is a radiograph with the ICD placement. Pacemaker versus ICD. How is an ICD different from a pacemaker? The difference between an ICD and a pacemaker. Pacemakers are used to control heart rate, preventing it from going too slow or too fast, while ICDs are usually to prevent cardiac fibrillation. Pacemakers are more of a temporary solution to consistently correct heart rate issues, while ICDs are permanent safeguard against sudden cardiac death. Is ICD a pacemaker? An ICD has the ability to act as a pacemaker. However, it has the ability to detect dangerously fast heart rates called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation and stop them. A pacemaker versus ICD. Triple lumen catheter. A triple lumen catheter is a hollow tube inserted into a blood vessel, duct, or body cavity to keep passageway open and allow drainage or insertion of fluid. Attached to the catheter, but lying outside the body, is the lumen. When three separate lumens are attached to a single catheter, it is called a triple lumen catheter. Through the different lumens or ports, medical staff can draw blood, administer fluids, or medications. The this type of catheter allows healthcare professionals to perform many different procedures without having to undergo multiple needle sticks. Dialysis catheter. A dialysis catheter is a catheter used for exchanging blood to and from the hemodialysis machine from the patient. Chest radiograph of the dialysis catheter. A nasogastric tube. A nasogastric tube or NG tube is a special tube that carries food and medicine to the stomach through the nose. 
an NG tube placement radiograph. Dumphoff. A Dumphoff tube is a small bore flexible nasogastric feeding tube that has, typically has a diameter of about 4 millimeters. It is generally used to administer nourishment medicine to people who cannot ingest anything by mouth. This tube is inserted by the stomach by the way of a nasal passage. Correct placement in the body is usually checked by an x-ray. Unlike a tube used for GI drainage, there is no suction attached to a Dubhoff tube. It is smaller and more flexible than other NG tubes. Therefore, it usually is more comfortable for the patient. The tube is inserted by the use of a guide wire called a stylet, which is removed after the tube has in the, been placed in the correct position and been confirmed. Reading graph of a Dubhoff. The end. Now go to trauma positioning.